Today is April 29th, 2020. I've got a lot of personal satisfaction doing this video today. My guest, Gordy Tong, I've known through the uh, Vancouver UFO meetup group that I founded about 11 years ago. We've been friends for about uh, 10 years. And I've always wanted to record Gordy. And he's been shy, I didn't want to do it. Once we did it, he gave a three hour talk to my meetup and we did a 15 minute video of me. <laughs> we never recorded Gordy. So it's, it's a real pleasure to have Gordy on my show. So. Uh, Gordy Tong is uh, 71 years old, a local ufologist here. He's been involved in ufology for almost six years. And uh, so welcome to the show, Gordy. Great to have you. Actually, more than six years. It's been over 30 years. No, I mean, uh, 60, 60 years. Oh, not 60 years, no. Well, I think it's early 60s. But we should tell the audience, where were you born and when did you move to Canada? Okay, I was born in China. I came here when I was just a baby with my family. Well, what, so, what province were you from? Guangdong province. Ah, came here as a baby. Yeah, so um, most of my memory is is here in Canada. I've been back to China. My wife is from China. Well, you you're involved, I think, with the Flying Saucer Club in Vancouver in 1963? Well, I attended some of their meetings. I wasn't really a member, but my brother, uh, yeah. he, uh, he told me about this meeting and invited me. So you're yeah. 15 years old then. So yeah, just tell us perhaps just a bit about your background and what got you into ufology and your story. And then maybe a bit about the history of the Vancouver UFO scene. And there's a okay. lot of topics we could talk about. I'd like to suggest we could actually do a series of videos because Gordy knows so much of this stuff. You know, he's, he's a local ufologist right here in Vancouver. So it's great to have you, Gordy. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I guess my first interest in the UFO subject uh, was possibly through uh, you know, my brother's interest. I wasn't that interested, but I read a few UFO books that I borrowed from the library, and uh, like George Adamski's uh, Encounters and so on. And then, uh, yeah, I went to hear some of the speakers at the UFO Meetup group and some special s speakers uh, and contactees from the well, 50s. What was it called Meetup in those days, right? It was the Flying Saucer Club? Yeah, back then it was just called the Flying Saucer Where Club. Where did they meet in Vancouver? They met for a while at the Peter Pan... Um, um, studio or something on Broadway and then he moved to Never another Never heard location. of it. Peter Benz, it's probably gone now. Yeah, it's, it, it was a place that was like a, uh, you know, like a theater uh, where, you know, they're at seating and, and What, what block of Broadway was it? I can't remember. I, I think it was a little bit west of what is London Drugs right now, maybe near Oak Street. Oh. Yeah, but that was a long <laughs> time ago. There was actually a plaque about the Flying Saucer Club on Hastings Street, not far from my house because they used to have um, um, uh, they used to have a, a table at the um, at the sh uh, the hobby show, and so I met some of the members of the uh, of, of that was uh, uh, the Flying Saucer Club, yeah, and that's how I met my good friend Brian Fuster. Well, I met so, Brian Fuster before he died. Yeah, yeah. So this is really away. important. I had no idea that there's this plaque from the Flying Saucer Club. I love this kind of detail. So talk yeah, as long a, as you it's, want. <laughs> it's not exactly a plaque. It's a, a photo from the old Flying Saucer Club with a, a, a brief description of that club. But it's last time I saw it, it was on Hastings Street, not far from London Drugs, on near between Penticton and uh, and uh, Slocan. Cool. So. so you're, Anyways, you're, that, that, you're a history historian for Vancouver Ecology. So through the Flying Saucer Club, I, I met Brian, but also I uh, met, uh, met um, um, Graham Conway, who was head of, became the head of UFOBC. Yes, I was an associate with them, UFOBC. Richard Tortorella is their president today. They do a lot of good work with their website, ufobc.ca. I'll link be below this. Video. Yeah, I've gone to some of their meetings, and uh, I've been to Graham's house and to hear you know, some of the People there were, uh, you know, uh, case studies and research. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Anything else about? Yeah. So, uh, so the nineteen sixties. Uh, what What was your progression through the nineteen sixties? With your, did you continue going to meetings or did you drop out? Your brother was no, into I, it. I, you were said, right? I, I was. Um, you know, I, I was starting to be, you know, uh, a little disinterested. I didn't see anything really. Uh, you know anything solid? I uh, just heard various testimonials and. How, how dare you? How can you say that? I'm offended. <laughs> but anyways, uh, uh, at the time I, w I wasn't that interested. But I had a UFO sighting when I was in Mex uh, New Mexico, driving a vehicle with some friends. Wow! Tell us and, about that. And, tell us about uh, that. Well, anyways, I was just driving late at night. I was the 
practically only one sleeping in the car uh, that wasn't sleeping in the car. And over on the right side in the desert, I saw some uh, lights that looked like flares, but they were jumping around, not like, you know, flares usually just fall slowly. And they were just, you know, showing up higher, lower, and then they were moving around, but they seemed to be going in, in the same direction as my car. So that was my first sighting. I've had some sightings here in Vancouver as well. I used to live in Kits and- Wait, But you know what they a, say in, in UFO sightings, they want, a date and a time. Do you remember the year, or the the season, at least? It would be the it would be in the early seventies. I don't have the act um, the actual date and time. So you're about twenty years old then. Okay. A little over twenty, yeah. Because you're so, born in nineteen forty eight. Yep. November. Okay. So you're, okay, very good. Carry on. This is getting good. We're gonna get the whole Gordy Tom White story in the Brian <laughs> show. Uh, I should actually mention at the beginning that. Uh, we share this interest in ufology, but you don't share my interest in revisionist history of World War II or who's behind the new, new World Order. You're not involved in any of that stuff. So you're oh, hesitant actually, about coming uh, on my show. Actually, I uh, was starting to research the, the New World Order um, ah. maybe about 25, 30 years ago. There was uh, quite a bit of interest in, um, in certain, uh, let's say, books on prophecy that were coming out uh, that uh, some, uh, some Christians were reading. I ran a bookstore up in Prince Rupert for a while, and there was a book by Hal Lindsey called Late Great Planet Earth. And I remember that was, in high school, that book. I yeah, so I read that book, and uh, that spurred uh, some interest in what is called biblical prophecy. Or, and so, but in these books, they were implying that prophecy in scripture was uh, uh, predicting that there would be some kind of world government, a world order. Uh, they didn't use the term world order or world government. It was, but it was something that would be worldwide. It would, um, it would involve uh, maybe a, uh, eventually a single world leader. Uh, at that time, Hal Lindsey thought that the uh, common market would, that was coming together um, or had come together in Europe was um, was an indication that this could lead into like a 10 nation confederacy. There's a number 10 that's in the book of revelations. And right now uh, the European union has more than 10 nations. Okay. So that prophecy that the Euro European union was this 10 nation confederacy under the leadership of a being called the antichrist that was mentioned in this book. But right now there is a map. Anybody that has Google image search, they can look up what is called the new world order map or the Club of Rome map, it's very similar. And it splits the whole world into 10 major regions. So instead of 10 countries in Europe, which Hal Lindsay suggested was this 10 nations mentioned in prophecy, there was this idea of a 10 regions of the world. And you, anybody can see this map, just go to Google image search, type in new world order map or Club of Rome map, and the whole world split into 10 major regions. Well, these 10 major regions, according to biblical prophecy, will come under the leadership of, of someone um, that the Bible has labeled the Antichrist. Okay. Well, I should also mention to the audience that you're a devout Christian, so your view in ufology is, is influenced by your Christian beliefs. Yes, but not just Christian. You know, I, I have a yeah. background in science as well, so I'm very interested in scientific evidence. And yeah, maybe give a bit of your bio, your educational background for the audience. Well, when I finished high school, I, uh, um, uh, I wanted to go into science eventually, and I did at UBC. I, I, uh, first year was just first year of science. You know, I had to take all the different you know, physics, um, physics, chemistry, biology, and so on. But I started to focus in more on uh, the biological sciences. I took microbiologies, uh, some basic biochemistry, uh, cell biology, and I was starting to see um, that, there, that living things were, and DNA was a very complex system. Yeah. The biochemistry of even basic uh, young, uh, I mean, uh, bacteria is very complex. You know, I was amazed how complex the living things were. So at that time, I had already become a Christian um, uh, uh, in the early years at, at UBC. So I guess you could say you and I, we both agree we don't believe in evolution we believe in some intelligent design we don't well, think it we, just evolved that way well chance alone cannot explain the the, the fine-tuning yeah. of the universe the complexity of, of of living things 
And, you know, this planet is an incredible planet to have so many forms of life, uh, oh, such you. a great, great diversity of life, human life, animal, plant life. But there seems to be uh, a kind of a consciousness in living things as well. Okay. And so anyways, uh, I could hard, I couldn't explain this on, on the basis of, of chance or evolution alone. So when we have very complex systems and the structure of DNA is extremely complex, it's, it's a code that you know, helps to create all living things on this planet. So some scientists just say that that DNA code is so complex it could not have just evolved by chance. And so there's different theories. I agree. Buddhists and Christians both agree. We, we don't believe in evolution. <laughs> we both agree right. on that. So anyways... Um, let's get it back to the ufo subject though so so anyways um uh my brother got interested and he invited me to some meetings i heard some contactees share their stories some of the stuff was fantastic but it's very hard to verify okay uh, from a scientific perspective they they had these in encounters and um and there was people like george adamski daniel fry uh daniel fry actually spoke here in vancouver about his experiences and uh, there was somebody else as well um, who, who was fellow. daniel fry i don't remember him do you want to give he you was any? a ufo contactee from the 1950s so was he famous at the time like one of these guys you go on tour he was, and he talks <laughs> yes he did oh. okay uh, but there's another fellow as well um van tassel have you heard of van tassel yeah i've uh, heard of van tassel george van tassel he spoke as well so i heard him speak Tell us a bit about who these people are or where they're from, you know. Well, the they are some of the contactees from the 50s. They claim they met often human-looking aliens that were, um, uh, you know, they had spiritual messages. Some of them claim they came from Venus or Mars. Uh, we also have the case of Valiant Thor that was written about by Dr. Frank Stranges. Yeah, you're the uh, one who first told me about Valiant Thor. I think he's for yeah, real. He told me a lot well, about Well, Valiant him. Thor, um, there's not just one witness to this person, Valiant Thor, uh, according to Dr. Strange, Stranges, who was invited to the Pentagon uh, to meet this person. Uh, this, this person looked human, but he was, had no fingerprints, no navel. He was highly telepathic. <laughs> okay, so uh, he knew a lot of things about Dr. Strange. Dr. Strange was uh, a Christian minister who had a background in psychology and criminology and theology, but somebody from the Pentagon, a woman, uh, her name I think was Nancy Warren, uh, heard that uh, Dr. Strange was speaking at this church in Washington, D.C., and said, would you come and I want to introduce you to somebody at the Pentagon uh, with your background. I think you might be able to, you know, help us. So he went to the Pentagon, and Valiant Thor was, you know, he was another um, you know, human-looking alien, claiming he came from the planet Venus, but not the surface of the planet, because you know, nobody can live on the surface, but from inside the planet. So there's this idea that certain planets and moons are hollow. Uh, that's another big topic, but we won't go that, in that direction. So um, anyways, uh, so, so my, I did get involved a little bit with the Flying Saucer Club, and then I when I attended meetings at the UFO, uh, uh, UFO BC. That's where I met Graham Conway. And uh, then I heard about the meetup group uh, that you started. Yeah, I started in uh, June 3rd, 2009, and you joined shortly afterwards. So we yeah, I joined each other. shortly after, and I, I attended quite a few of your meetings and got to know people that were uh, abductees, contactees. Yeah, we've like known Alan. each other over 10 years. There's a big scene. Like, we had the third largest UFO meetup in North America, meetings like, 20, 25 people. We met some really, like people like Doug. You and I know Doug. We won't say his last name. Incredible yeah, that's right. Doug was there. I got to know him. Probably 10 people abducted by aliens. It was a real scene we had. Yeah. Uh, later, there was a conference where Paul Hellier spoke, and some of the people at the UFO meetup uh, went there to hear him, and uh, Richard Dolan. And uh, Dolan stayed with you for a while. Yeah, right? we did a video. The audience can see. I can link below this video. Dolan was here so, in June 2014. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, uh, but I, eventually I did see a UFO myself. I told you in the desert in New Mexico. And then I saw a UFO when I was living in Kitts, when I was looking out at a telescope at the time. And I was looking out toward Bowen Island and I saw a, 
a yellow light that was quite bright over Bowen Island. And I, it wasn't, wasn't the planet Venus. It wasn't anything I've ever seen before. You know, this is a hot spot, I should mention. I just released two videos of two other people who saw a UFO right around Kitt's area, around Kitt's Beach. And I saw one, like yeah. on the street where I live, all heading in the same direction. Like, uh, you're the one that told me that Cypress Bowl is a UFO hotspot. There might be an alien base behind Cypress Bowl. So for the audience, Bowen Island is just a little bit west of Cypress Bowl. Well, um, I met a fellow, that, uh, there was a fellow named Charles Lamoureux. You may have heard of him. Uh, yeah, I've met Charles. He he's, he's has a professional nursing background, but he bought a lot of uh, night vision equipment and started to monitor uh, UFO activity um, in the infrared spectrum uh, over Vancouver. And he said he saw UFOs heading toward uh, Cypress Mountain. Really? Yeah, and he saw them over, you know, right over Vancouver. They were he's not, got a YouTube YouTube channel. Is it just his name? That's Charles right. Lemmer? He's got a, a short documentary that he was involved with too. So I've he's met got him a bunch person. of videos. On, on yeah, YouTube. I met him in person, and also. Me too. Uh, were you at the talk with uh, Dr. Paul Kingsbury out at in, SFU? In Surrey. Surrey. Yeah. yeah. So Charles drove in the car with us. That's how I know. Yeah, he Charles drove was was there, and he's there. Uh, he in, he introduced me to uh, Dr. Paul Kingsbury, a professor of uh, geography at ah. SFU, but who had an interest in paranormal phenomena. UFOs, Bigfoot, um, and you know the the phenomenon of hauntings or ghosts. Yeah, so that's Cypress Well, Do you want to do a bit more while we're on at the history? So you went to the 1970s. Do you want to talk about 1970s, 80s, 90s? Well, in '89, Brian and I went to uh, my first MUFON conference that was in Las Vegas. That's a mutual. It's a mutual UFO network. MUFON. Yeah, yeah. Big it's one. one of the largest uh, UFO yeah. research groups. Um, uh, in the world, uh, they have many members in the United States, and I've I've met some of the members and speakers. Jacques Vallee spoke at that conference, and I've read some of his books. And he was one who uh, originally held to the um, Jacques Vallee was was depicted in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. There was this French um, yeah. Yeah. Ufo ufologist that went to different places in the world. Well, that was based on yeah Jacques Vallee. Jalen Heineck was an associate also of Jacques Vallee, and uh, he's been, um, yeah, he's been involved with UFO research. He was a skeptic initially, uh, worked for the Air Force with Project Blue Book. But both of them started off with that this phenomena could be ET, that it could be extraterrestrial. Yeah. But then they started to see other phenomena and things related uh, to their studies of ancient history, folklore, and so on, that they, they suggest that this phenomenon may be interdimensional. That doesn't, ah, it, yeah. that doesn't mean it can't be extraterrestrial, but they started to lean toward the extraterrestrial, uh, interdimensional hypotheses. Yeah, these are the two big hypotheses. And, and Buddhism, Christianity also has that interdimensional idea, like in Buddhism, yeah, it gave us in, another realms of existence. Yeah, in, in certain religions, like the, uh, the Christian religion, the Jewish religion, uh, uh, there's an idea of interdimensionality to the universe or that we live in a supernatural universe. There are beings that are created by God that are not human. Uh, there's, you know, angels. There are beings that have been created by uh, what are called the sons of God and the daughters of men. This the phenomena we call the Nephilim, uh, the Nephilim uh, thing that's described in the book of Genesis and in the book of Enoch. So, uh, the Bible seems to suggest that, yeah, that we live in an interdimensional universe, but we're not the only, you know, um, intelligent beings. Humans are not, you know, we think we're the highest intelligence here, you know, on Earth. That's right. But, we're the highest. But, <laughs> but in the universe, uh, there could be other beings that uh, have been created by God. Some of them have, uh, many of them, I believe, have free choice like humans. And with free choice, we can do great things or good things. For, for everyone on this planet. But, you know, we have a history of wars, genocide, <laughs> all kinds of, you know, slavery. Um, amazing, uh, not amazing, but awful atrocities. But there's also done. demonic beings like in the higher realms. I know you have a Christian belief in Satan. And your view on ufology is somewhat negative, but a lot of it's negative satanic. That's, that's been a theme you've discussed for the last 10 well, years. 
the phenomena that we like valiant thor has been described by people that knew him as being some kind of angel okay and they thought he was an unfallen angel an angel that had not you know uh, uh, been seduced by lucifer and was not did not you know didn't uh, didn't become uh -huh. you know, didn't become fallen so they were very interested in the teaching of Valiant Thor because he, they thought he was an angelic messenger. And Valiant Thor claimed that he believed in God, that he acknowledged that there was a creator, that Jesus Christ was who, he claimed, who the Bible claims to be. And I contacted Dr. Strange's wife. Uh, she's still alive, but Dr. Strange has passed away. And uh, uh, his wife uh, sent me a copy of what is called the teaching of Valiant Thor and uh, information from what they call the Inner Circle uh, newsletter. This is cool. And Valiant Thor claimed that Jesus Christ was a special guest of their council meetings uh, when they gathered. You know, they, they had some kind of large mothership or, that they met. They uh, had meetings on. And so, uh, so Valiant Thor he made first contact with not not with Dr. Frank Strange, but he actually apparently landed a, a UFO or a, a disc shaped craft uh, outside of um, outside of Washington D.C. in think, New Jersey. I think it was wasn't it Alexandria, Virginia? Yes, it could be in Alexandria. I think it's Alexandria, Virginia. But anyway, myself, the, I know Alexandria. But the police uh, somehow heard about his landing, and uh, Bounty Thor uh, requested that he would be taken to the Pentagon and to meet, uh, at that time, the President of the United States. But did the police uh, give him a ticket for parking in the wrong place, something like that? No, I never heard about the ticket, but they somehow right. they, they believed what he was saying, that he was you know, a visitor from another world. Um, that's very similar to the, uh, I think it was the 1950s movie, uh, Strange, uh, the day the earth stood still. Yeah, and that was a CIA-inspired movie, right? They wanted to test how Americans in the world would react to the UFO landing because they didn't even know at that point whether a, a, an invasion yeah. was actually underway. There were so many flying saucers sightings. Of that. Yeah, so the day, yeah, 1952, there was a uh, there was uh, UFOs that flew over uh, Washington D.C. that were seen over the Congress building. Yeah, There's Richard Dolan has a video called uh, 1952, Year of the Flying Saucer. I think it's a book, actually. Yeah, and that was 52, but remember Roswell happened in 1947. Yeah. So, so the Americans were starting to see UFOs, and then the Roswell crash. and Big time. Uh, then the recovery of the UFO. And so, so uh, yeah, so science fiction started to portray a lot of the stuff, and then we had War of the Worlds, you know, inspired by H.G. Wells. And... Um, but so uh, uh, UFO, uh, uh, interest in UFOs in the United States, yeah, started, uh, yeah, major interest was started, I think, around 1947 after the war. But even yeah, during Ke the Kevin war. Kevin Arnold, Kevin Arnold, June 1947. But even during the war, uh, there were pilots, uh, American and British pilots, and maybe yeah. German pilots that saw what they call Foo Fighters. Yeah. They were, you know, sometimes uh, unidentified lights or large orbs or something that they saw uh, over, uh, over battle, uh, you know, over Germany or other places. They were also seen in the Pacific as well. Um, so anyways, so we do have a phenomena that appears to be real. Yeah. Uh, it could be extraterrestrial, but it also could be interdimensional. Yeah. But the beings that are, are speaking to, to people in contact experiences, they are promoting a particular worldview or philosophy. Valiant Thor uh, has a theistic philosophy, but it's blended with um, what I call a pantheistic monistic philosophy that all is one, all is God. He talks about... Uh, I, I don't agree with that. Buddhists don't agree with that. Uh, no, Christians no, no, no. don't Mo agree with that. Most Christians do not believe that God and the creation are all one. Yeah, we know, don't believe in a oneness doctrine. In Mahayana yeah. Buddhism, they have non-duality, but we don't have that in Theravada Buddhism. The Buddha never taught yeah. non-duality. But Valiant Thor and other uh, so-called human-looking or uh, spiritual aliens have promoted this concept of oneness. Uh, they also promote spiritual disciplines like uh, this idea of, um, uh, uh, have you heard of the term guided imagery? For or, sure, I've done that. Yeah, well, if you use guided imagery, it is a way to make contact. 
It's actually with books like this, um, one of my favorite spiritual growth, growth by uh, Smyre Rowan, Being Your Higher Self. Yeah. So and, if it's, and, I do this kind of stuff. It's cool. You know, it depends what kind of imagery, I guess, that you're doing. Okay. Well, if you use um, your imagination, and Valiant Thor was teaching something to the uh, people in the inner circle groups, that, um, that if you visualize with your mind a door, and he called it a magic door. The teaching of Valiant Thor uh, has, has been posted on various websites. So like, and if it says door, you can open this door of the, your mind and go through it, and uh. you'll go sometimes into a place that looks like a Garden of Eden or something, and there you're told that you will meet beings there that will further teach you or instruct you, okay? But the UFO, contact, the UFO abduction phenomenon, the contact phenomenon has has phenomena without any form of, of spiritual discipline. So there's people that desire contact. They just put out mental thoughts they, that they want contact. They just say, you know, there's a term called mental intent. Uh, some people use meditation. And, and so this, so f f fast forward a little bit. I met a fellow at, uh, uh, in the early days. His name was Lauren Goldfader. Yeah, he's here in Vancouver, right? Yeah, he was a postal office worker, but he had a real interest in the UFO subject. Yeah, tell us about uh, Lauren. Yeah, Lauren, uh, uh, um, he went to SFU to hear Dr. Stephen Greer give a talk on the protocols of how to make contact. Was that in the year 2001? It could have been. I'm the exact. The he was exact here just date. before 9/11, I think. Yeah, I didn't go to that conference. Because Terry Tabando has been on my show. He lives here. He organized yeah, that. Yeah, Terry Vanna would probably have gone there, but um, Lauren went there, and so he heard some of the protocols that Dr. Stephen Greer used. Uh, Greer claims to be a contact geek as well, and so he used some of these protocols. Like um, for him, it was um, uh, symbols. Uh, uh, strobes through symbols uh, in, on a turntable that he that he uh, he uh, projected up into the sky. I don't know where he did it, whether it was Cypress Bowl or somewhere. And that was when he made contact. So initially, the contact experiences appeared to be fairly benign. He thought he said he was taken uh, to a, a deep underground base somewhere in Europe. I think it was in the country of Switzerland. And at first he thought everything was cool. He, he thought he was uh, chosen to be a healer. Sounds cool. Yeah, but he showed me evidence that he was uh, an abductee. Uh, he came over to my place in Kits and we had an ultraviolet light and it showed uh, uh, his skin had various marks. Some of them look like bruises, others. There's been marks that have been um, put on abductees well, what and, year was this that happened with Lauren? Oh, uh, that was over 20 years ago, before I met you. Like in the okay. 1990s? Uh, I, yeah, I would say in the 90s. Okay. Uh, but anyways, he came over and we videotaped and documented that he had these marks that could only show up under ultraviolet light. There's a, re a UFO researcher in the U.S., Daryl Sims. He's also used UV light to notice some of these marks. Some of these marks have geometric shapes. They can be triangles sets of dots that are geometric. Uh, and so Lauren did show me some thing, you know, some marks on his body uh, that, um, you know, you couldn't see normally, but we could see it under UV. So anyways, he, he thought everything was cool, everything was fine. And so after a while, I lost touch with, um, uh, with, um, with uh, uh, Lauren. But then there threw a, uh, a person who was, who knew Lauren, Goldfeder and also Graham Conway, a fellow named Neil Gilchrist. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah, he's he's a, told me about him. I yeah, tell the a, audience, Gordy would sometimes phone me, you know, every week or two weeks, go on and on. I said, like, Gordy, we've got to get you on the show. We've got to get you on the show. So, well, so Neil talked a lot of this stuff. <laughs> Gilchrist uh, uh, knew Graham Conway. He knew many of the people I knew back then and Lauren as well. But anyways, he uh, was in touch with Helen, a friend of Lauren's. And through Helen, I was able to get the phone number about 15 years later. She's the uh, one that came to our meetup a few months ago. Here that's right. I chatted with her again. But Helen. Yeah, I met her. Yeah. Uh, uh, she's lost time all contact with Lauren. But she, before she lost contact and I lost contact again, uh, I was able to talk to Lauren. So Lauren uh, 
uh, I didn't see him in person, but over the phone, he said, you know, everything is not fine anymore. I mean, he was experiencing poltergeist activity in his apartment. He thought uh, aliens were speaking to him, but they, I said, can you see them? And he said, I can't, but they're speaking to me. Uh, so many people in the UFO BC knew about what was happening to Lauren. They, some of them thought, you know, maybe he was going crazy or something. Yeah, actually, was, I was going to UFO BC meetings around uh, 2012, 13, and Richard Tartarell, our president, he, he warned us that Lauren Goldfeder was disturbed. He was very disturbed. So when I spoke to him on the phone, he felt very paranoid, very disturbed. He says that UFOs were uh, landing and cloaking uh, over his apartment in uh, uh, the Mount Pleasant area of Vancouver. Which yeah, is Broadway. another UFO hotspot where Vancouver City Hall is. And there's a famous photo of a UFO right yes. over Vancouver yeah. City Hall in 1937. Yeah, well, anyways, uh, he said UFOs were, um, you know, cloaking and um, sometimes landing above his apartment. or and But he said they were abducting people in his neighborhood. Probably okay. true. Probably true. And uh, he said some of these people are being taken to, again, deep underground bases in different places in the world. I believe and, it. And like he himself was taken, you know. And so so he was pretty paranoid on the phone. And um, But after a while, as we were talking, the what he thought were aliens in his apartment were telling him to get off the phone, to, to, to don't talk anymore. Wow, okay? he was getting interfered. Uh, it was almost like uh, they didn't want him to talk too much about certain Well, that's my experience with other people, experiences here in Vancouver, they're being in, interfered with. I should show yeah. the audience, I got my uh, Vancouver UFO meetup Brian Pin each got a... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so anyways, um, Lauren became more and more reclusive, okay? But he was very interested in the abduction phenomena. He met um, uh, uh, various abductees through UFO BST and on his own. And then there was Mike Stranick as well, who was the head of MUFON in Canada. I got to know him. Uh, have you ever met Mike? No, yeah, but you're so well connected. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, Mike, uh, he did speak at, a, I think, at a UFO meetup group here, a, a UFO media a conference here, but also in Seattle. I went to a conference where I met John Mack. And, uh, John Linda Mack ha from Harvard Linda University. Howe, Linda Howe was there. Yeah. And... Uh, but I, I met uh, Bud Hopkins in 1989 um, in, uh, in, in Las Vegas. No, Bud Hopkins gave one of his last talks of his career to my UFO meetup group on the cell phone, Doug's cell phone at the time. Might have been his last talk just before he died yeah. in 2011. Him and Dr. David Jacob, they had a very pessimistic view about this abduction phenomenon. Yeah. You know, uh, if you read Dr. David Jacob's book, The Threat, or some of... Um, some of um, yeah, I got them here. Uh, um, Bud Hopkins books, they started to see, you know, that uh, this is a, a very invasive uh, phenomena that was taking people away from their homes. Uh, there were eyewitnesses sometimes to uh, some of these abductions, sometimes there weren't. Uh, there was a case in New York where there was a woman that was taken out of her uh, high-rise apartment and taken into you if there were witnesses on the ground that saw it. And Bud Hopkins did some research on that. But Anyway, so I want to comment uh, though about Hopkins. I've done videos with Mary Rodwell in Australia. She's another UFO researcher and um, she does, I guess, a lot of therapy type work. She had a meeting yeah. with Bud Hopkins and she was just describing more of the positive side of it. She said Bud Hopkins got up at middle lunch, got up and walked away. Never spoke well, again. So Mary had a Rodwell, difference in view, she said. Yeah, Mary Rodwell, I was in contact with her by email for a while too. She has a very positive view. There are researchers that view the phenomena as being positive or benign or spiritual. There's others like Jacobs and uh, Valley, John Keel. They have a more negative view of this whole phenomena. Uh, and that would, I would include uh, Tim, if he could, one of the top and, British and you, researchers. And I guess you have a more negative view, and I guess I have a, a mixed view. <laughs> well, the phenomena can appear to be benign. Valiant Thor. Uh, appeared to be, you know, someone that was willing to help mankind. He said he could heal our diseases. He offered, uh, if, if this is true, to Eisenhower. And I think Nixon witnessed some of this as well, Richard Nixon. That, yeah, um, I would blame Nick. I, I'd say Eisenhower was quite an evil president. So I, I was, he was part of the cabal or whatever. I would say I would blame Eisenhower for that, not Valiant Thorvald. I'll let you talk. You're the guest. Okay, well, <laughs> well 
uh, Randy Thor was a special guest at the Pentagon for um, off and on, I think off and on for three years. He was not a prisoner, but he was, there were some of the generals that met with him. They were not interested in his offer to heal mankind of our diseases. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, what they were interested in is maybe, you know, how do you fly your UFO? What's your propulsion system? Or, you know, how can, can we, we beat the Russians? <laughs> or how can we weaponize some of this technology? Yeah, yeah. Some, but Valiant Thor apparently wasn't willing to disclose any of that. But anyway, so, uh, so Dr. Frank Stranges became the ongoing contactee for Valiant Thor for many, many years until he died. Uh, what was interesting is that um, Valiant Thor at times did help uh, Dr. Strange, according to the book that he wrote, uh, when he was in the hospital, they came and healed him, okay? There were times when uh, he was protected from the men in black that were after him, you know, by Valiant Thor and his crew. Ah. That was described in his interviews and books. But then when he slipped and fell in his, in his house, Valiant Thor didn't show up to heal him. I thought that was, you know, if he could heal and he was a good friend of Dr. Strange, why didn't he come? Was it his time to, to leave this yeah, world? Yeah, my of, answer to that is the law of karma. We, we all got to go. We all got to die. So he, well, can't, we all he have, can't interfere with the laws of the universe. Yeah, maybe sometimes you can't always stop people from dying. So that's fine. Yes. But the, the new contact D for Valiant Thor is a, a Hollywood uh, film producer who worked on the show Dune. And he made a 20-minute short called Stranger at the Pentagon, which was supposed to, you know, if he had enough funny, become a feature film. Is it on so, YouTube? Uh, it's, it was on Vimo. It's not on YouTube. But there is stuff about uh, this and clips from the movie Stranger at the Pentagon on YouTube. Yeah. Before Dr. Frank Stranges passed away, uh, he introduced Valiant Thor in some way to Craig Campobasso because Craig Campobasso came to Valiant Thor and thought, his story would make an interesting film, you know. So the film shows with actors, Valiant Thor and his crew, uh, they, uh, and, and what happened at the Pentagon. And that um, according to the film, 20-minute uh, film, Valiant Thor was actually, um, he, he seemed to be under some kind of uh, duress or, uh, or torture uh, at a time at the Pentagon, they were by, trying to get information. By the humans or the aliens? Uh, by 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 uh, some of the uh, uh, I guess some of the military brass that wanted uh, you know information from them. Can he just pop away into another dimension and get out of there? Well, that's the thing. He had an ability to dematerialize his body and just disappear. But there were times when he didn't, and they put some helmet on his head. And according to the twenty-minute film, it, it looked like they were they were trying to you know, give him some shock therapy or something to, to get, you know, things out of his, um, uh, out of, you know. Yeah, they uh, want to get whatever they can get from the aliens, right? They're they wanted to get information out yeah. of them. So, so uh, anyways, uh, but like I say, when you examine uh, the teaching of Valiant Thor, which some of it I read, he does seem to have some Christian ideas, that, a theistic idea of God, that there's a creator, that Jesus Christ is who he claims to be that he, he has an unfallen relationship. Now, he claimed unfallen relationship. Well, there are angels in the Bible that are, un, are unfallen, and there's angels that are described as being fallen. They're also called the watchers in the book of Enoch and in the book of Daniel. So these fallen angels, uh, like Lucifer is like the leader of the fallen angels, they can appear in many forms. They have many names. Um, uh, they, yeah, they can make pacts with people. You've heard of this idea, pacts with the devil. Yeah, and uh, Buddhism teaches the same thing. Well, like in the jinn, in, uh, you know, uh, the Arab world, the jinn can also, like a genie can give you what you want. They, if you ask them, uh, they can give you some of your wishes, right? Uh, but the genie, the jinn, uh, Michael Crichton was the head, uh, one of the head uh, editors of Flying Saucer Review. And in his research of the UFO phenomena, he's, he saw parallels with the jinn phenomena and what are called UFO aliens and entities. They have an appear, uh, jinn have an ability to shape shift. They can appear in one form or change their form. I've talked to abductees that say, well, I met this uh, alien that uh, appeared in a human form. And I think at the meetup group, there was a woman who said, 
uh, this alien said, do you want to see me in another form? Oh, I, I missed and that conversation. Yeah, and this, this alien that looked human, like Valiant Thor, shapeshifted to look uh, like a gray alien. Right in front of her? Right in front of her. Wow. Now, Dr. Carla Turner, who wrote the book uh, Masquerade of Angels and uh, this other book called uh, uh, oh, Taken, yeah, Taken, she was interviewing a number of abductees. She was an abductee herself, and uh, I think some members of her family were. But she, uh, she interviewed very other, other abductees, and they said that they witnessed this shape-shifting as well. Also, there's people that are abductees that are taken aboard a UFO, and sometimes they're not abductees or contactees, and they meet this person that they think is Jesus Christ. It's not uh, Jesus Christ. It's not Jesus Christ, but it looks like Jesus, like the Jesus that Valiant Thor introduced people to. Uh, uh, George King, who started the Ethere Society, uh, he was a contactee. He was using yoga uh, a lot, and eventually he had a UFO encounter, and he was taken aboard, or during this encounter, he claimed he saw the Master Jesus. <laughs> okay? Uh, Ray L., who started the Ray Alien movement, he claimed he... he he was taking aboard a UFO, taken to another realm or dimension or planet. Yeah, that's the UFO sex cult, Riel. Yeah, that's the cult that uh, Vali, uh, Jacques Vallée investigated, the Rielian movement. And yeah. they, the followers of Riel claim that he is like a prophet, a messiah. Uh, not right? to me, he's not. No, he <laughs> also claims to be the Maitreya Buddha, you know, for Buddhists. Well, just on behalf of Buddhism, Maitreya Buddha cannot come to the world until Buddhism is extinguished from the world. That's the story. It's, it's impossible that Maitreya could be here. It's supposed to be way in the future after Buddhism is gone. That's the whole point of having the next Buddha. But actually, well, anyway. I, one thing I, I want to finish is uh, just in terms of time. I mean, this okay. video might be good just to finish the history of ufology in Vancouver. Then we can do another video. Because you talked a bit of up until the 1990s. You want to talk a bit about anything else, 2000, 2010. Just finish okay, the history uh, here. Then well, we'll do another one video. thing that I've been looking at uh, uh, recently uh, is this: uh, there's a new TV series, and I, I'm not sure if it's on Amazon Prime or or on cable TV, but it's called "The Secret of the Skinwalker Ranch." Yeah, yeah. I have a friend that spoke at the meetup group, Chad Deacon. Remember him? Yeah, yeah, Chad Deacon. Yeah, yeah. He, he got a big. He, he, he did crop circles. We had about seven yeah. people. That was around 2010. Yeah, he was one of uh, Canada's most famous crop circle researchers. He spent a lot of time researching crop circles here in Canada and also in England. I remember at the end of his talk, he said, "After all these years, you know, I still not any closer to figuring out what these things are." <laughs> he did have paranormal experiences in some of the crop circles yeah. in Canada. Uh, like he heard strange sounds when he and his wife were camping in a crop circle in Saskatchewan. These sounds got louder and louder, and there was, you could hear some footsteps and something that was, you know, uh, this was in the middle of the night. It was very dark. What kind and of it, sounds? It sounded like footsteps and maybe some other sounds that uh, disturbed their sleep. Well, I had that one at 16 once. I never understood what Well, happened. anyways, they were a bit frightened. They packed up their uh, <laughs> tent and got the out of the, the crop circle. They didn't want to stay in a crop circle. At least now, so in the middle of the out. night, they packed up? Well, there was a case they found a porcupine that was squashed in a crop circle in uh -oh. Canada. This thing was dead. And there's been uh, animals that have been mutilated near what are called saucer nests or crop circles in England and and I think in, in some other countries. Well, you know, so getting mutilated is one of the worst ways to spend your Well, afternoon. that's why I was interested in the Skinwalker Ranch. I, I gave a short talk on the Skinwalker Ranch, a short video at one of your meetup groups. The Skinwalker Ranch is kind of a hot spot for UFO and paranormal phenomena. There's everything there. There's hauntings, poltergeist activity, uh, orbs that can kill dogs that are chasing and pursuing it, animals that are being re relocated from one part of part of the uh, ranch to, to another part. Sometimes they're, they're, they're confined inside a, uh, like, a, uh, like a trailer. They didn't walk into this trailer by themselves. They found this, they were put in this trailer. And when people opened the door, these animals just went crazy. <laughs> you know, they were, uh, but anyways, there was so much paranormal phenomena, including the UFO phenomena. This, this place, uh, even according to Chad Deacon, appears to be some kind of hotspot, paranormal hotspot. It's a portal place. 
Now, it used to be owned by Robert Bigelow, who started the uh, NIDS organization. It was through NIDS that Chad Deacon was somehow, they, they contacted him because he was doing all we this crop tell circle. NIDS is the Near Death Sciences? No, no, no. NIDS is the National Institute for Discovery Science. Oh, okay. <laughs> they had scientists at the Skinwalker Ranch, and uh, George Knapp was there for a while, and they wrote a book of uh, uh, Hunt for the Skinwalker. From coast to Coast Radio. So they were... They, but the sci there are new scientists there now. There's a new owner. His name is Brandon, Brandon Fugel. He lives in Salt Lake City, but he, he bought the property from Robert Bigelow. And he has a particular interest in the ranch for various reasons because he has an interest in, you know, a lot of things like UFOs. Uh, uh, but he is wondering, uh, he's a Mormon, okay? And he's wondering if some of the phenomena on the ranch uh, could be of... Of, of a possible demonic nature. That's one, I read an um, uh, article about the owner, um, but he's just trying to figure out what's happening on the ranch through science or whatever it means. And so was Robert Bigelow. I read an article from the National Institute of Discovery Science website of how, see, the reason why this branch is called Skinwalker Ranch. Now, why skin, is it called Skinwalker? Well, the skinwalker, according to Aboriginal beliefs, was an evil shaman who became this shape-shifting skinwalker. Okay, and well, what does skinwalker mean? What did he? Is that what he looked like? Uh, he can take. He's a shapeshifter. He can appear in many forms. He can appear like uh, as a, a bigfoot creature, like creature, uh, yeah. like being. He I could appear it. as a giant wolf. They've actually shot gi large wolves there with guns that should have killed these wolves and these wolves just you know a bit of fur flies off the wolf but the, the wolf is not killed so I'd like to no examine that fur under a microscope see what it's made yeah of. <laughs> uh, but anyways there's been cattle mutilations on the ranch uh, uh, a previous um, family was terrorized by some of the things that happened on the ranch so it is definitely a paranormal hotspot now what is interesting is that the Bible says that there are places like that. In the, the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, it talks about Babylon. Remember, Babylon was this uh, city, uh, eventually, that Nebuchadnezzar claimed he helped to build. And then later, uh, so Babylon is a real place, but it says that this place became a habitation of uh, foul spirits, strange birds, cryptid satyrs, uh, things, it, it became something like, yeah, a place that was cursed. And so there is a phenomenon in the States. Um, uh, you, I, I, I will br briefly bring up the research of Dr. Dave, I mean, David Pilates. David Pilates has a criminal investigation background. He was a police officer. But uh, in the last, uh, I don't know, many, many years, he's been researching missing people. And some of these missing people in national parks like Yosemite. He did something on the Skinwalker Ranch recently that there's been a missing hunter uh, that was near, uh, last seen near a reservoir north of the uh, was it ranch. But there are places where he says there are lights in the sky. People are seeing lights in the sky and people, and there's cryptid creatures, sometimes like Bigfoot creatures maybe in these areas. But people are mysteriously sometimes teleported from one place to another in, in this location. Sometimes very young children that are just two or three years old, they're 20 miles away from where they were last seen. And they're found and okay, they're all right when they're found. Some of them are found okay, but sometimes their clothes are, they're missing their clothes. But wow. sometimes they show up again on the trail that they've already searched many times. Uh, they seem to be just teleported or uh, taken from one place and dropped off in another. But there's been yeah. adults that have disappeared, fishermen, hunters. Uh, yeah. And so I would recommend seeing, but he was doing, had an interest in the Skinwalker Ranch because he, he was wondering if there was missing people close to the Skinwalker Ranch. And he did find out there was one case. And west of this, I think west of the Skinwalker Ranch, there was uh, cases. Here in British Columbia, um, there's an area we call Merritt, BC. Yeah, I've been to Merritt. I had a friend that went up there camping, and he saw lights in the sky with well, some a three-hour drive from Vancouver East out in the countryside. That's right. He, he, when he, my friend uh, Nixon, who works in the film industry, he and some of his friends were camping up there about a year, uh, a year ago, and he said he saw lights in the sky. 
But then I did a search about missing people and I went to a, a UFO uh, reporting site. There had been UFOs seen in the Marin area. Not, my friends were not the only one that saw the UFOs. But now there's more missing people. You mean in Merritt? In Merritt? In the Merritt Kamloops area. People, so Pilates is, is noticing this connection with, with, between paranormal hotspots or places where paranormal activity has been reported, like at Yosemite. And this goes back to possible land that has been cursed. But do you want to just finish, uh, just with our time, just finish up any history of ufology of Vancouver, then we could do another video? Would you finish this one? Well, I don't have much more to say about, I mean, uh, you can talk, you should interview some people uh, in the UFOBC website. They would have some of that history. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, but you're older than they but, are. They're young, uh, but, younger yeah. guys. But some of the people like Lauren and Graham are gone. But before uh, Graham passed away, he, he suffered uh, some type of uh, a meningitis infection. I think he, okay. he was a, a, an abductee or contacting that may have led to his death. Uh, right? He hinted to me that he was yeah. an abductee, that there was marks that showed up on his on his foot or leg. Martin Jasek told me as well. Martin yeah, Jassic he 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 uh, he did share with some other people in UFO BC uh, that he was a possible abductee. Okay, now Dr. Carler and but wasn't his death uh, though? Wasn't his death related to an infection or something? Well, this that? is this is a possibility. Dr. Carler Turner, uh, she became an abductee. She's an English professor. She had she had her own website. She wrote books on the UFO subject, and she. Um, yeah, uh, she believes that the phenomena can shape shift. Not only that, many abductees that she interviewed were coming down with various infections and cancer. She herself died of a, a wow. rapid active, rapid form of cancer that killed her. Wow, but some uh, people get healed, like Doug, we know, and well, others get healed. Well, here's the thing. There are some people that do get healed, but others, they don't get healed or... or uh, like when ranchers take care of cattle and some of these cattle are going to the slaughter, if a cattle gets, uh, if a, a prized bull or a, or a calf uh, is sick, they'll heal it. They'll heal it. They'll heal the, you know, they'll get a, a veterinarian or somebody to heal the, because it, they don't want to lose a prize. Um, oh, you, uh, you, you don't mean the aliens will heal it. You mean the humans will heal it. That he, well, well, veterinarians or that are humans will heal. So, yeah. But if the rancher is raising these cattle for the slaughter, what? sure, you can heal an animal, right? You know, we take our cats and dogs to vets. But, but you know, here in Canada, we don't eat these animals. But in, in some countries, cats and dogs, like in China, are bats are being eaten by people, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. we've heard about the wet market and yeah maybe uh, but anyways uh, uh so um carla turner said and and you can read her article called um uh, aliens in the gingerbread house and she describes what is happening to some of the abductees and some of them are coming down with uh life-threatening um illnesses and infections there was a case of a ufo that flew over some place in washington state there was a gelatinous material that dropped out of this UFO and onto the ground. Dogs that got too close to this stuff or touched it got sick and died. So maybe the aliens decide who lives and who dies, who gets healed and who gets cancer and dies. Maybe they just decide, right? They well, have their own reasons. They have the power over life and death over people. If, if people... They have the power of life and death probably over the planet. <laughs> well, humans have power over domestic animals, you know, that they raise for... for 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 this for you know for meat that's eaten by their that's humans. That's the analogy. So, like Richard Dolan uses that analogy. This dog's quite intelligent. This dog knows when he's going okay. to get fed, but, but he doesn't here, know where dog food comes from. But something at the Skinwalker Ranch is mutilating cattle, and there's a phenomenon that Dolan uh, said was happening uh, that it's called a hitchhiker phenomenon. It follows you home. But maybe we should just wrap up with Vancouver. I guess you're both done with Vancouver UFOlogy history, right? Yeah. And Graham Vancouver, Conway, he was, he was a foundational figure. He yeah, used to give he, talks at the planetarium here with yeah, hundreds uh, of people. Graham right? and Brian were friends of mine. So was Lauren Goldtrigger. So three of my friends that have done UFO research 
We should uh, mention Dorothy Isett. She's a famous uh, yeah, Chinese uh, lady here who could see UFOs and film. Yeah, them. I met World her famous. in person as well. And Jalen Heine came to uh, meet her uh, with Brian Fuster. Oh, uh, I didn't know I, that. I, I phoned her. I did a phone interview in my first book. I, I have my Yeah, I've seen some of her videos. And she's had many. Uh, she's a contactee. So uh, Jay Allen Heine came to Vancouver to see her. She lived in Richmond here. That's right. Oh, I she, didn't know that. He came up and... and, and I think Brian showed me a picture of Heineck when he was here with Dorothy Isaac. Did you meet so, J. Allen, Allen Heineck? No, unfortunately, I would have loved to meet him. You know, <laughs> he but, died in '86. So why wow, you got I, such a rich history of Vancouver UFO scene? You know. Well, uh, I guess I'm one of the older researchers that have been around for for. A while. Oh, you and uh, Terry Tabando, yeah. Yeah, Terry Tabando's been around for a long time. So. I think you've been involved in the scene more than anyone in the entire city. You've been in and out of all these groups, you know? Well, uh, there could be some other people that are with UFO BC that have been researching a long time, but yeah, yeah. I'm, I guess I'm one of the older ones now that are s still around. At least you're one willing to be on the Brian Roos show. That makes you special. Is there anything well, else you want to say about history? We could wrap up this video now and do another one on the other stuff, you know? Okay, well, uh, there's still more things I could chat about, but we did cover quite a bit already, and some of the things I wrote down uh, as notes we've covered already. So any further any further things to say or, or questions? Well, or? well, I guess like for the YouTube audience, they like things about an hour or less. So why don't we wrap up this video and then do another one, different t different title. Okay, well, let's, uh, uh, let's see how uh, people respond to this, um, this video. And... Um, and if people want to hear more, we can we can dig into this phenomenon. This phenomenon is very complex. It's got it's multifaceted. It's it 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 appears to be benign sometimes, and other times it doesn't. It 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 there is some kind of deception going on with some of the contact and yeah and, uh, t teaching of spirituality that's passed on. Uh, there is another Jesus that's presented sometimes in this phenomena. That's well, not you don't, Jesus. You don't believe in this Jesus. No, I. Actually, Jesus himself warned that before his own second coming, there will be people claiming to come in his name and claiming to be the Christ, that they would show up. And this is where we have the idea of the Antichrist or a, a false prophet uh, that will show up in the last days. What is happening with this globalism thing right now? There's many, many people on this planet that are buying this, this desire for global world community, a concept of oneness. Uh, that world religions can come together. Yeah, the one uh, world religion, which I think is a scary idea. No one's well, going to force me as a Buddhist to take on some other one world religion. Well, there's something uniting religions that didn't re re unite, re unite, uh, unite religions before. Religions kept in their own camp before. But there's something called unitive mystical experiences. And this was described in an article in Common Ground magazine that that these unitive mystical experiences can unite the religions of the world. I don't so, trust Common Ground Magazine either. I know the editor no, no, personally. No, I no, don't, I don't trust them I know them personally. But, this, but there was an article about religions of the, uh, the world unite. And I have a friend named Carl Tycrib. He's written a book called Game of Gods. Uh, he's, he's been involved with UFO conferences. He's done research at the Burning Man Festival many times. And he says that some of the high tech people, uh, you know, from big uh, tech companies in the States are turning, attending what are called uh, these transformative festivals. This you is can, planned from the top down. It's probably globalist leading to the one world religion one decade well, at a time. Well, it's not orchestrated just by humans. Uh -uh. There, are, there are interdimensional entities that are passing on this concept of oneness. Uh, he went to a, a conference uh, in February, it was a pagan conference that he was researching, I think in the States that he's been to before. These uh, modern day neo-pagans or pagans are claiming that the gods are speaking to them now. They want worship. They want people to, like in the old days, to you know, ancient people built temples to these gods in Egypt yeah. and Greece. Yeah. And so these beings now, but some of these pagans modern pagans are interested in the UFO phenomenon, see how that connects. And they're interested in also in psychedelics, that psychedelics and, and things that shamans have used to make contact with the spirit realm or the, the, you know, the gods of the Amazon, the beings of the Amazon, the spirits of the that Amazon. That could be bad, but it could be good too. It could be an awakening to seeing real aliens. Well, it, well, if you have no discernment to tell what the spirits, who the spirits are and 
you have no, uh, there's a gift of discernment that can come from God. And that gift of discernment oh, thank can, you. That can, anybody can ask for this. If, if people want to know what the truth is, God is not going to hide the truth from people. And as the Bible says, the truth will set you free. So if we desire to know what the truth is, all we have to do is ask the creator to show us what the truth is. If we're not sure about what it is and we're, has, we're skeptical about certain religions or manifestations of religion, there's been, you know, religions have turned into cults that are uh, the deadly. Uh, Waco is a good example. Um, How about that UFO cult in California where 20 well, people committed was, suicide was, when the comet again, came? Heaven's Gate that was started by oh. Applewhite, who was a contactee, okay? So uh, uh, Dr. Jacques Vallee in his book, Messenger's Deception, say that the UFO contactee phenomena can result in the formation of high demand religions and cults and authoritarian forms of government. That's, in his, that's his conclusion in, mess, in the book, Messengers of Deception. So Gordon, so, maybe we should get together. Maybe we can make some money at this, a high authoritarian cult. Think we can put something together? What do you say? Well, uh, if you try to expose some of this stuff and, and what's behind the globes of phenomena, uh, you may face censorship. You may face blacklisting. You may face yeah, I mean, you face some of this stuff already, you know what I mean? But there could, uh, some of the, uh, even Ellie Marzulli, he's getting a streaming video censored now on Vimo, okay? Uh, my comments on my YouTube channel are all deleted now. Oh, yeah, all tell us about your YouTube channel. Give us your, can people contact you by email? Do you want to give your email address to well, the Well, they, they can, uh, they can um, uh, go and leave comments on, but they can't leave comments anymore. That's been all you know, it's gone. So, but uh, yes, they can contact me through you or, uh, you know, uh, if they need to contact me, you can give them my email address okay. or phone number. What's the name of your YouTube channel? It's called Noah's Dove. Noah's Dove. And how many uh, you, subscribers if, do you have? I've got about 8,000 subscribers right cool. now. Oh, great. In order to, uh, to find this website, you have to type in YouTube search Noah's Dove and you'll get to a, um, a white square with a blue Dove, click on that, and that's my YouTube channel. So there's interviews with uh, people like uh, with L.A. Marzulli and Al Matthews. There's other re UFO researchers. It's a uh, it covers a broad range of topics. Okay. And so it is a YouTube channel, or is it a website? No, it's a YouTube channel. Okay. It's a YouTube channel. So that's one way to look at more research. And uh, Al Matthews is. I did an interview with Al Matthews on my YouTube channel, that's there. We should and just then, introduce Al Matthews. He, uh, he took my UFO course I taught at the New Westminster School Board in 2009. That's how I first met him. Then he joined my UFO meetup group. And then he met Gordy. Then uh, Gordy introduced him to L.A. Marzul. He's quite a well-known Christian ufologist in California. So now yeah, Al's been in UFO movies. He's been quite well-known. So I, I'm the one that discovered Al Matthews. <laughs> yeah, Al Matthews, uh, yeah, was a former abductee. And you know, we can talk about him uh, more next time. But uh, yeah. he's he was quite paranoid about the phenomenon. He was he was getting abducted, and, and his whole car was lifted up into a boat in, in Quebec. Yeah. In Quebec. He was uh, he he was so uh, paranoid. He didn't want to live there anymore. He, Let's get him on the show sometime. Maybe you and I and him could do a Zoom together, the three of us. Well, That'd be cool. if he's open to it, you know, he's yeah. sometimes he's you know he doesn't always want to be on YouTube. But yeah, he's already he's been, on. He's already on YouTube now. So many people know lot, the yeah. story. If they want to hear their sto uh, the story, they can go uh, to my YouTube <laughs> channel. There's interviews with him on my YouTube channel. But maybe someday yep. you can, you know, we can talk to him and see if he's interested. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm the one that discovered him and brought him into the whole UFO community. He, he I remember, he was quite cautious. He, he, he told us this, and I remember the classroom we're in, the New Westminster School Board, just the one yeah. course I would teach each term, or just a one night class on UFOs. That's how we met Doug as well. New Westminster School Board. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the meetup group uh, was a, a place where people c could meet, mm -hmm. other people and researchers. And, and that was even before the UFO, well, that was apart from the UFO meeting. I just taught a night school course on ufology. They paid me like 70 bucks to teach it. And then I introduced those people to the meetup group. Yeah. At that time. Yeah. So we can delve into this more if people want. And, uh, you know, let's see what the response is to this, uh, this first interview. Yeah, let's wrap up now. But I really want to thank you for being on the show, Gordon. I can tell from the names that you drop, you've got a steel trap memory and you've got such a history. So I'm really, really pleased we finally got you on video, Gordon. Thanks for being on the show.
Well, thank you for having me on, and uh, it's it's been good to uh, yeah to, to 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 talk to you again uh, through Skype and now through Zoom. Yeah, thanks.